spend a little bit more time talking about Beowulf before we transition to Chaucer, and this is going to lead us into a transition of Chaucer as well. So put your finishing touches on that and your name, and I'll be collecting that shortly. But first thing I want to do to finish up Beowulf is to look at it from a structural standpoint. Most people, when they analyze Beowulf, analyze Beowulf according to the three monsters that Beowulf fights. Some people call this the three Aegons, the three struggles that he has to overcome. The first monster is, of course, Grendel. Quick question. Has anyone attended the Ohio Renaissance Festival and seen the Mud Show? The Mud Show is a very popular show at the Renaissance Festival, which if you know anything about the Renaissance Festival, it's a bunch of drunk people who get together on the weekends and perform shows for, for dollars. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can we do a class field trip? It would be a lot of fun. The problem is it is only in the fall. And uh, so you have to organize something in September. The MUD show, M-U-D-D-E. Wait, and we should still, we should just organize it and us as yeah. a group go outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you could. Yeah, email us again. When you organize it, I'll go with you. Okay. okay. And here's the thing, so I also need a free ticket. So How much does it cost? They're like 16, 18 bucks. If it was there, it's all of us chipping and stuff. Yeah. Three bucks, three bucks a piece. Yeah, I need a free ticket for my wife and my daughter. What? That's all. <laughs> your wife or your daughter? Good. At yeah. least one of them sucks. <laughs> well, that's harsh. I say it's a small one. At least. That's harsh. Yeah. Here's the thing. At the Mud Show, you've got three guys, shirtless, and shouldn't be, <laughs> performing Beowulf. Yes. And they're, the thing, and they get the audience to participate, and so there's this thing wherever you go, Grendel, Grendel, hoo hoo. Grendel, Grendel, boo-boo, Grendel, Grendel, boo-boo, and then Grendel jumps out and attacks Beowulf. At one point, Beowulf dives under the mud to find Grendel's mother and returns with a massive bra <laughs> and claims it's a treasure map. <laughs> so it's a very body rendition of Beowulf, but nonetheless, it has, the, it has two of the three monsters. Grendel, the fiendish monster, and then, of course, the second monster, Grendel's mom who's upset because her son has been killed, and he dies a horribly slow, agonizing death, okay, because of his arm and the loss of blood and all of that. Then the third is, of course, the dragon. The three monsters that Beowulf fights, each representing something different about Beowulf, and we'll talk about that, but some critics also look at Beowulf as being a story out of three monsters, of three groups of people. So what would the three groups of people be that really are the focal center point of this story? The Danes. The Geats. The Swedes. Because of the way they interact in some of their gatherings and whatnot. We, for our intense purposes, are going to focus on the monsters. Our story opens with Grendel causing a lot of problems for what king? Hrothgar, who has Herod Hall, and the hall is where he gets together to drink mead. This is a time period where people love to drink mead, and he can't get together and drink mead with his guys anymore because Grendel is causing a problem. Can anyone tell me why Grendel's upset? It's loud. It's really loud. And his ears are super sensitive. Now he's a demon, he's a monster, he's a direct descendant of what biblical character? This is an example of our Christian narrator attempting to influence the story by putting Christian elements into it. How do we explain the existence of a demon or a dragon? Well, you can't explain it. But the Christian narrator says, well, he's a descendant of Cain, because Cain is evil. And so if evil's in the world, this thing comes from Cain. So again, it feels kind of like you're in Sunday school hearing a story about Achilles. It's a little strange. But this is what he does. He says, Randall's a descendant of Cain, Grendel gets mad, Grendel comes by, and when Grendel's mad, instead of saying, hey, could you all turn it down, he eats them. Nice. It is kind of cool. Picture him picking up Alec, and <sighs> bites his head. Off. Off. Removes it from the body. Tosses the corpse. He does this with multiple people at night. 
This isn't just a one-time thing. He's a problem. The king, what's his name? Krakow. Can't do anything about it. He's mad. He's frustrated. So, all of a sudden, someone comes to save the day, and this person, of course, is Beowulf. Beowulf arrives with all of his people, they jump off the ship, they go to Hrothgar, they pay homage to him, they say, you're an amazing king, we love you, we're here to help you. And Beowulf says, I will fight Grendel in what way? With all arms. Hand to hand, naked, just me. Because no sword can cut him, no blade can pierce, right? Wait, did he know that? Or he's just... It's what he, he basically decided that he could get more glory, more fame if he fought him this way. This is a guy who's obsessed with glory because this is a time period that is really big on several key ideas. The first one, of course, being fate. Let fate decide. Now, this idea of fate runs a little contrary to our Christian narrator's point of view. So the Christian narrator tries to carefully weave the two. Let me give you an example. There is one point in our poem where the Christian narrator talks about the war loom. Now, do you remember in mythology the significance of the loom or the weaving? The fates would weave a person's fate, right? The fates would weave a person's fate, and when they would cut the string, that person would die. The loom has always been associated with fate. Did anyone see that ridiculously silly Angelina Jolie movie called Wanted? <laughs> Do you just have something against Angelina Jolie? I'm starting to get that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess you didn't like something. <laughs> I didn't mind it. It was kind of cute. Yeah, there you go. So in Wanted, there's this weaving and this loom, and it determines fate. And so it's this reference to mythology. But the point is this. Weaving is always mythology and fate. However, the Christian poet says, the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom. He's fusing Christian language with pagan ideology. It's, it's, it's interesting because it shows you how Christianity developed early on here in England. You know, it's basically like if you go into a group of people and you bring a new religion, they're going to merge it with some aspects of their, of their past, of their past beliefs. And so this is what we see kind of the evolution of Christianity here. The idea of fate, but then also the idea of pride. Pride, not necessarily in a bad way, but it could have devastating consequences. Explain to me how pride eventually led to Beowulf's downfall. Because you get pride, 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 pride alone. Do, alone. do what alone? Fight the dragon. Fight the dragon. By the way, how long was he king before he decided to fight the dragon? Fifty years. Dude's an old guy at this point. Okay, he's an old man. He's going to be like 70 something. He's probably even older than that. You know, he's an older man fighting this dragon, decides to go in and fight him alone. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that pretty much all those guys run away except for one. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Very nice. Yeah. So, his pride leads him to believe that he can do certain things that he might not be able to do anymore. But nonetheless, it's also something that makes him who he is. Pride has been an ongoing issue for all of our epic heroes. Now, we mentioned the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. Who's the hero of the Iliad? Not Odysseus. The Iliad begins by the speaker saying, sing, O muse, of the wrath of, insert name of character. Achilles. 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 I said Achilles. I said I said it before so you did. All right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, but I said before. Four. Achilles is ultimately our epic hero. And what is his downfall? His heel. His heel. Okay, well, yes. That is according to the mythology. In the Iliad, there is no Achilles heel. In the Iliad, he doesn't even die. But in the Iliad, his downfall at the very beginning oh, oh. is he's being a pouty little whiny baby. Anyone remember why? Oh, yeah, because she was like, you can either... Um, stay home and have children in a happy life, or you can live forever and have glory. Yeah, that's actually not in the Iliad. That's in the mythology of Achilles before he goes to the war. The Iliad opens with the leader of the Greek army, Agamemnon, having taken away Achilles' favorite girl that he won. Took her away from him. And he says, no, I'm not going to fight. That's how it opens. Because <laughs> Agamemnon wounded Achilles' pride. And throughout the whole thing, it is Achilles' pride that ultimately brings about his downfall. Is Who is the epic hero in the Odyssey? Odysseus. Odysseus. There it is, Odysseus. Odysseus 
early on in the Odyssey makes a massive mistake with regard to his pride. Anyone? 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 Nobody. Giants? Yes. Uh, doesn't he yes. Nobody. Yes. Like, um, he yes. His name. Yeah. yeah. So he's stuck in the cave of Polyphemus, and he tells Polyphemus, "My name is nobody, nobody, or no man, nobody, no man." They then blind Polyphemus with the burned stake, like actual piece of wood, <laughs> not like media rare. <laughs> they burn him. Polyphemus runs outside, and all the other Cyclops are like, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And he says. Nobody has burned me. Nobody has blinded me. And they say, oh, that's weird. I don't want anything to do with you. So then they leave. But then, as Odysseus escapes with his men on the boat, he's on a boat and he's, he's going, going fast and... So he's on his boat. He's sailing away. And then what does he do? Yo, Brian Dolphins. This was Odysseus. He's like, dude, by the way, my name's actually Odysseus. I live here. I'm the son of this person. Just so you know, okay? He's forgetting a pretty key thing. Poseidon. Poseidon is what? The god of the sea. And the father, the father of the Cyclops. So, Polyphemus says, hey, daddy, this guy Odysseus blinded me, and he's on your back right now. Poseidon says, oh, let me take care of this. Hence, the entire story, the dude should have been home in a month, takes him years and years and years. Why? Because of his pride. You have the same sort of thing with Aeneas in the Aeneid. All throughout the story, you have an epic hero who ultimately succumbs to pride. What's the fancy word for pride we have? Hubris. And the hubris is ultimately then their downfall. Downfall, the tragic failing in some way. It brings us about. So all of these epic stories, Beowulf is our epic poem in English. I'll be honest with you, it's not quite as cool as the Iliad and the Odyssey. What are you talking I, I about? know, I know, we need to own it. Okay, we need no to own way. it. That was we need to be sweet. like, we need to be like, dude, ours is as good as the Iliad. It's not as good as the Iliad. But it's still pretty cool. It's also one fifth the length of the Iliad. <laughs> so Which we have that great. <laughs> we have that going for us. So throughout the story, Beowulf encounters these three struggles and goes through these three primary things. Now, let me ask you this. We've kind of talked about this already, but what makes Beowulf an enjoyable story? Not what, what, makes us, what makes us <laughs> like it? Oh, it's so epic. This one yes. dude does everything. It's got a great setting. I really appreciate it. He's like 85 and he takes down a freaking yeah. dragon. How well? I think, I think it's just beautiful because it's a great translation. <laughs> Imagine if it was worse. <laughs> yeah. See, here's the thing. Hi, Beowulf. None of us really like reading Beowulf, this is like but we love the story of Beowulf. Yeah. There is something about a ton this time period that, that allures us. Because we don't live in this kind of time period anymore. We live in a time period where you hop in your car, you plug in your iPhone, you listen to your music, you go home, you watch your Netflix, you go to bed, you wake up, you go to school, you do the thing. We don't live in a time period where you might walk outside and encounter a dragon, or wind up on Jurassic Park and have to battle a Triceratops, yes. which would be awesome. It's not. But we it. absolutely long for a life of adventure that we don't have anymore. I mean, come on, we have no adventure in our lives. We never had dragons. What are we, you talking? We have space. We can keep going. There is something that appeals to us about a time period so far removed from our own that it has elements that we will never encounter, and we can only live vicariously through. Think about this for a moment. We're never going to be Beowulf. We're never going to meet a Beowulf. Oh, oh, true. Just, yeah. True. Come on. Okay. But through this experience, we can in some way feel what that was like when Beowulf faces down Grendel. It's weird for us because we're so far removed from poetry and from hearing this, but it's obviously an enduring story because it has survived probably close to 1,400 years, and has been made into several film versions, and has been translated many, many times over. So it is an enduring work of literature, not just as an example of Old English, but as an example of a time period we have all but lost. Pretty important work. Now, as I said, it is only one of a few works from this time period. So if we are to look once again at our timeline, Beowulf was written roughly in, in between one to two years. Somewhere, Somewhere between these. 1066 is William the Conqueror. This begins to change English in some way. Now, Old English not much survives. 
we have a couple things like the Dream of the Rood and Beowulf and things like that. But Middle English is where we start to get more of what actually looks like English. And to give you a specific example of what this looks like, we are going to attempt something. Put no one's in here. Row there. Turn to the side that starts with Quan. W H A N. Quan. The other side here. Without cheating, without looking, I want you to attempt to translate just this front page. I want you to look at these words and try to figure out what they say. This would be considered Middle English. So just under each line, try to write out a translation of what you believe this may actually be. Do we have to have 